time, pipette in hand in the lab. But my outside of work, um, I have a great interest in kind of how openness can change the way that we're doing science. So I guess I would probably class myself as one of the young people that uh, Jeffrey referred to in his talk. And many of those um, views that were expressed on that slide quite chimed with me. So um, I'll go on and just explain um, briefly what the Open Knowledge Foundation does. Um, and so, that, well, I should also say the title of my talk is uh, Why Open Data Means Better Science. However, um, I think Jeffrey did a fantastic job of explaining many of the points that I was going to go over. So um, we'll frame this as reinforcement <laughs> when I repeat points that he's already made. But I will try and um, put a slightly different spin on things. Um, so the Open Knowledge Foundation is uh, a global movement to open up knowledge in all areas, not only science. Um, they're uh, an organization that works uh, largely with government data. That was where it kind of all started from. Um, but now we have community-based uh, volunteer working groups for everything from open economics. Velichka, our coordinator for open econo economics, is here today. Um, open humanities, transport data, um, a whole bunch of, um, of arenas in which openness and particularly access to open data can really change the way in which we do things. Um, so one of the things that uh, is of interest perhaps to the sort of data repository people here is that um, Open Knowledge Foundation uh, found it runs um, a, an open source data portal software called CCAN, which forms the basis of uh, many open government data publication projects, including the UK, and uh, recently announced that the US will now be using CCAN for its open government data. However, it's also of use um, for academic data, and for those of you that are around tomorrow for the more technical interoperability workshops, um, I'll be around if you have any questions about CCAN and how it might be used in an academic context. Um, so, the Open Science Working Group, um, I've been coordinating this, this group for just over two years. Um, we founded in 2008 um, as the Open Data in Science Working Group, and I think it just goes to show how much um, the, the breadth of kind of open science and how excited people have got about the open science movement um, that we recently decided to, to change our name to the Open Science Group just to represent the broad membership we have of people that are interested in all areas of open research, um, not just the data, but obviously open access, um, citizen science, ways of doing research transparently. Um, so this is our, the definition that we, we use to describe open science. Um, scientific knowledge in all its forms, methodology, um, how we go about the, the research process, through to the research outputs, be it code, data, publications, that people are free to use, reuse, and distribute without legal, technological, or social restrictions. Um, and we're a, a, so we're a community-based group, um, which means that we're essentially a network of people around the globe who are interested in this kind of area. And um, we currently have around about 450 people on our mailing list from all across the world. Um, and it, it's growing rapidly as uh, you know, the open science movement really expands, particularly now that in the last couple of years we've seen major reports coming out from the Royal Society, um, the European Commission, the UK government, and, um, and it's becoming a little bit more mainstream. So we do projects to um, produce guidelines. Um, one of the very first projects the working group embarked on was the Panton Principles for Open Data in Science, which were really a kind of a very clear statement about um, how data should be made open in terms of the licensing aimed at researchers. Um, and so the, the kind of basis of this was that science itself is based on building on reusing and openly criticizing the published body of scientific knowledge. And so for that to happen, um, and for society to re reap the full benefits, it's crucial that the data is made open. So this is the Phantom Principles is a set of four basic principles. The, the, the main message is that if, you're, if you want to make your data available for other people to reuse, you should very clearly indicate um, under what terms you're making it available. Um, it's still quite difficult sometimes to actually work out um, how open a data set is. Um, so we recommended very explicit licensing and in fact that all scientific data should be licensed into the public domain, um, possibly using a CC0 license. So Creative Commons have a, have a zero license which holds no, um, no uh, requirements on the, on the user of that data, although there are others of an equivalent nature. And so the idea here is that um, you just remove as many restrictions as possible on its reuse so that anyone can take that data and reuse it. Um, 
for open access, the recommended license is CC BY, and I'm sure many of you will be aware that the only difference there is a requirement for attribution. So we're not saying by recommending CC0 that you should not attribute data that you use, but more that that falls within a scientific community norm. And in fact, if you don't cite, cite or in some way acknowledge data that you've used, um, that's, that's bad science and that you know, you'll be penalized by your community for, for plagiarizing or for not, um, not making use of data um, in a way that's acceptable. Although that raises interesting questions when people are feeding in lots and lots and lots of data sets into a project as to how you actually go about fulfilling that um, you know, uh, community norm of, of citation and acknowledgement. And I'm sure that's something we'll be discussing in presentations later on. So this is pretty much the status quo at the moment of availability of data um, as a bench scientist, I've experienced this <laughs> very frustration myself. Um, and so data availability in most fields, so it, it varies massively between disciplines. Um, if you've got something like um, genomic data where that community already has quite large global databases and there's a community, a cultural norm for putting your data in that one place, then yes, it's relatively easy to find. It's, it's, you, you can use it, you know that it's, it, you know, licensed properly, you can just take it and do what you like with it and attribute um, as, as you might any other data set. Um, but actually, there are also lots of disparate data, databases, data sets, um, often sitting just on servers. Um, so if you want to acquire a data set to kind of verify a publication and look, at, look in more depth, it often um, requires a series of individual requests to the data holders. Um, so you might think, well, Okay, that's, that's sending off some emails. Obviously, if we're doing a, a major project involving many, many data sets, that's going to be difficult. But for you know, your average lab scientist, surely it can't be that hard. Um, well, actually, there's quite a few publications in the literature that demonstrate it actually is relatively difficult to get hold of data. And uh, data sharing um, is, uh, and so I should, I should point out that I don't know of any publications where uh, the, the authors have come out with a very positive conclusion about data sharing. That may be publication bias. I really haven't cherry-picked deliberately, <laughs> but, but all of these um, publications on the, the top row there um, were the, the researchers wrote to, or emailed authors um, to get the data sets that backed up their assertions that they made publicly in the scientific literature um, with very little success. So um, the, the top empirical study of data sharing by authors in PLOS journals and data sharing in medical research and empirical investigation, um, each contacted, uh, well, I think PLOS was 10 authors. They received one data set back, uh, even after repeated attempts. Many, refu many received outright refusals, despite the fact that authors usually sign to say they will make their data available when they publish in some of these journals. So, so there, there clearly is a problem, and the status quo um, is not what it should be. Um, an interesting article for anyone who, if you haven't seen it, is um, in the psychology field, this one, this re these researchers wrote to um, people pro uh, providing articles to a psychology journal over a certain period of time. Um, they then looked at, they reanalyzed that data using different statistical methods, and they actually found that the willingness to share the research data was less the closer that the statistical significance was to 0.05. And many of those data sets they found with a bit of a tweaking of the statistics, they could push into the non-significant area. But you can take, you can interpret from that what you will, but it's, they, the authors suggest that maybe, um, you know, if you're aware that your data is not of the best quality or that you've analyzed it in a way which is perhaps slightly, um, you know, pushing it towards one end of the scale, which um, we, we heard a quote in the previous presentation that suggested that data analysis among scientists can be quite poor, um, then, you know, that might affect your willingness to share. Um, okay, so our vision is to have data shared openly at the point of publication to, to back off any claims that you make in the scientific literature. Fantastic if it, if it comes out before that, and indeed for many genomics projects, um, you know, d bits of data sets will come off the sequencing machines and straight onto GenBank databases, and that's brilliant. But for most scientists, the point of publication is the point at which they will make that data available. So why does open data mean better science? As I say, many of these points we've already heard, but um, verification is one. So, you know, you can actually look, drill down into the details, um, particularly in, in fields where there are quite complicated statistical analyses. It might be interesting to um, 
have a look at, you know, was the data actually suitable for that statistical analysis? Have the authors done what you would have done? And just, and just really <laughs> dig down quite a lot. And so um, some of you may have heard of uh, a study at Duke University looking at choosing um, chemotherapy based on genomic sequencing, um, which was uh, which was a long battle from another two statisticians who, who got the data eventually um, and redid ana the analysis in a way that they thought was, was, was better um, and found that actually this, uh, this treatment was not effective or this choice of treatments was not effective. Um, they fought very hard to block the clinical trials that were going on there um, and eventually succeeded, although interestingly um, the, the real uh, kind of uh, contention about that actually arose after it was also independently discovered that the lead researcher had lied on his CV, and that was actually the spark point, not the fact that st statisticians had been pu trying to publish papers um, based on a kind of, uh, based on a different statistical analysis of the data, and actually struggling to do so, and I'll come back to that point later, that actually scientific publication as it stands is not really designed for people that want to verify or replicate studies, and it can be difficult to publish um, those kind of papers. So reproducing or replicating studies is also an area where um, open data can lead to uh, more rigor in science and you know, just, ver just checking that it is in fact reproducible. We've already heard that in many cases papers are not reproducible. Um, so one area where there's particular work on this is in um, big data science and also computing. Um, can you actually get computer simulations to give you the same results? Uh, when it's run by a separate group and you know later on we'll talk about what you actually might need on top of the data to actually achieve um, reproducibility and replication. So we talked about reuse of data so I'll just briefly give a couple of examples of that because I think we've already had we've already had quite a few um, but reuse of data can involve anything from a meta-analysis and we, we discussed we talked briefly um, about clinical trials um, and how many of those have a positive publication bias. But also, you know, the, the gold standard of medical evidence is a systematic review of all, um, of all publications on a particular treatment, just taking into account the fact that, you know, there is variation. You are going to get some negatives and some positives, but if you gather together enough studies, you'll get an overall impression of whether a treatment's actually effective. And, you, and getting the data and having access to the data itself rather than just the published result is essential for those kind of um, analyses. Um, one impediment to reuse, um, which you know, can, can, uh, can not only give a better impression of, of, of the scientific consensus but also um, lead to sort of new scientific discoveries, is that often data is, is hidden away in publications. Um, and so content mining, as already mentioned, is, is a growing area um, to, to enable us to drag in this data from various places. Um, when I say hidden, what I <laughs> that can mean that actually, although the data's been published with the paper, it's, uh, for instance, in a PDF format where you can't actually read it and it's of no use for reuse. And so in a second, we'll talk about why just being open doesn't necessarily mean that it, you're going to improve science. Um, and again, we mentioned efficiency, so enabling different groups to do parallel analyses of data. Um, so you don't have to wait for one, data, data, one group to release their data set for another group to work on a different aspect of it. And, and citizen science as well. If you have a massive data set, one, a, a good way in some areas to, to analyze that is to release it to many, many minds and many, many eyes um, to make light work, hopefully, of, of the analysis. However, open data doesn't necessarily mean better science all the time. So firstly, is openness enough? Well, open data is really a means to an end. I think this is quite clearly stated in Jeffrey's talk as well, that just making stuff open is not sufficient to make it useful and, and actually uh, be able to do all of the things that we've just talked about. So firstly, location and discoverability are very important. You may have openly licensed your data, but it's, if it's sitting on your own website and it's not linked properly to any publications or any major databases where people might be looking for it, then it can be quite hard to find. Um, and I've had this myself where I've not known for several months that an important transcriptome, or important to me anyway, has been released um, because it was not 
uh, put in the place where I would expect it to be put, which is the NCBI or EMBL databases. And the, the paper that it was published in did not make it obvious that that was part of the, of the, the data that they produced. So location and discoverability um, are also key. Standards and formats. We've, I just mentioned PDFs. If you reproduce your data as a table in a PDF, common problem in open government data that governments will say, we've released the data, but actually all you've got are pages and pages of PDF tables, which essentially need to be hand transcribed or they're of no use. Uh, standards, particularly for metadata, so how to describe the data and actually make it interoperable, um, often comes from the community. And, and they're, they're also important. Although there, there is an argument that just actually getting the stuff out there in as simple a format as possible is the best way, and then we can kind of work on the rest later. But it's still, the point is that when you release data, it should be released with reuse in mind. And that's, that's also a kind of cultural shift um, from what people are used to doing, which is essentially releasing data because they have to um, in, in some fields rather than because they actually want people to reuse it. In the same way that actually putting your paper under an open access license doesn't necessarily mean that you've written the paper in a way that someone else could do it. You may, have written, you may not have written the method in enough detail for someone else to, to reproduce it. And so kind of getting this idea of um, making your work reproducible and available for reuse at the core of starting from experimental design all the way through to the documentation is, is quite key. Data alone is not enough, and again, we kind of referred to this, or Jeffrey referred to this in the last talk. Um, so if you want to reuse and reproduce the data, the code or the software that's used um, is also important. Infrastructure for how the data is stored and linked is important, um, as is training. So in the corner, you can see Lucy, who is um, a community coordinator at the Open Knowledge Foundation, and she's been doing a lot of work with data journalists or rather journalists to turn them into data journalists. And actually, the use of data uh, um, to do large, especially large data sets to do analysis, it does involve specific skills which often just are not taught um, at you know, the, the kind of the graduate level or, the, or in early career, um, at the early career science level. So introducing training to meet these new challenges is, is really important. Um, from my own experiences, a lot of graduate training just ignores the internet ever happened, and we're taught how to write a paper in the old style, we're taught how to make a presentation, we're taught how to have good uh, in <laughs> discussions with our supervisor, but there's very little on kind of retrieving, using, and publishing information in the digital age. Um, and data alone is not enough in terms of, it needs to be linked to other data really to be of any reuse value in many cases. And so how to integrate it into an ecosystem of data and more generally into the digital commons. So all, um, so other forms of um, knowledge and data, be that a paper, be that perhaps um, government data, if you're interested in interrelating scientific data sets with, with policy or geographic information, all of this, um, this data is floating around uh, and it's how do you make it um, come together into one common ecosystem. Okay, so how do we move forward? Well, there are several cultural boundaries to moving forward with, use, with um, making open data actually in, improve science. Um, one of these, some, many of these are cultural, so there needs to be a lot of work with community building in certain disciplines to enable people to not only come up with how they want to release data, but also how they might reuse it. And in fact, um, for things like content mining, often researchers just aren't aware of the tools that are available and what they could do with that uh, research methodology. So, um, you know, making clear the possibilities is quite important. Um, and some communities have already done this very well. Um, genomics, for instance, bioinformaticians routinely release data openly. Um, and uh, Tim Gowers has mentioned, who's done a great job in bringing together mathematicians um, to fight for open access and promote open access and, and open collaboration to work on projects. Um, so it's really finding more community champions in different areas to, to stand up and, and talk about these things and, and to derive their own standards and their own ways of doing things that can then be linked with other areas. 
data infrastructure is, is important, and we heard a little bit about what the European Commission is planning on that, and I'm sure there'll be more talked about tomorrow. Um, but it needs to be made um, as easy as possible once researchers have a data set created that, that they can um, push it out there. And, and the, the standards are also important in terms of linking within that, that data infrastructure. So open data has the potential to improve both the quality and the pace of research. And I think the question is not really why um, open data means better science, because it clearly does, but really how we define what good openness is and how we actually go about achieving that. And I think there's quite a lot of advocacy still needed in certain areas to promote this idea that openness and sharing is good for you, because a major, a major barrier is the lack of incentives in, in many areas for actually putting your data set out there when you could hold on to it and get another publication. Um, and that's, I've, I've heard a lot of um, comments like that, especially from people where, for instance, the reproducibility criteria doesn't apply, so ecologists, it's very unlikely that someone would go and reproduce their experiment. Um, so they would say, well, you know, why, would, why should I release all of my data when that's not actually going to happen? But then there are other reanalyses that can be done and, and linking together. It, it w it's a shame to kind of not to do it now, um, because there currently isn't any way that it could be used without thinking forward to, to a future where perhaps we might want to link that data with another data set. Uh, so I would conclude to say that um, to move forward, we, we definitely need to get communities together to talk about this and, and encourage the kind of bottom-up approach that Geoffrey was suggesting. Um, and we can do this through organizations like learned societies. Um, and I know the EU is working very hard to bring people together as well in working groups to kind of talk about this um, rather, from rather than from just a mandated um, institution and funded perspective. But I think also that definitely does have a role to play, particularly at the beginning, um, to kind of get, get the stuff out there in the first place and actually show some of the possibilities. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, that's me. Thank you. Comments, 